I would argue that that's not true. The data are the important thing to pe for people to look at in the beginning, but those data are the way that those people are going to make use of your museum. And if you, as the museum, are the one to keep the best possible data, then they should always come to you first. Right? You've shared data, but the culture would be that you, at your institution, have the best and latest, greatest data, and you might have more information than is on the web. So this should be a way to bring people to you and your museum and create more use, create more importance for you as the primary source. In this way, it's actually useful that your data gets shared in more places and more places. The more places that it is, the better. It means more people are seeing it, more people are using it, and your museum becomes more relevant. But the important thing with the identifiers is that they know where it came from. They know where the primary source is. It's you. The next one has to do with deduplication, and this is a particular problem in botany where a single specimen is collected and then parts of it are shared among uh, institutions. Now, you can imagine that if the process was at the very beginning when the specimen was collected to attach global unique identifiers to all of its parts, the same global unique identifier to all of its parts, not to identify the specimen or herbarium, but to identify the individual organism We've identified the organism, and no matter where those sheets go, they will be connected to each other because they'll have the same identifier for the organism. With that, we have a really easy way to find duplicates after they've been separated from each other. Duplicates right now are a huge problem. They're okay as long as you're keeping track with which institution did it go to, under which catalog number, but it becomes a maintenance nightmare. And those who are trying to discover duplicates after the fact have difficult work cut out for them. Usually they have to use the collector name and number, and maybe the collector name and number and date and place, all these different pieces of information to try and discover which are duplicates. Whereas, if the duplicates were identified at the beginning with global unique identifiers, you would avoid this problem altogether. You could always relate them to each other. They're parts of the same individual. Following on to that, you can see that there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration as well. So one way to collaborate would be, suppose that I have the same example of duplicates with their global unique identifier for the individual on them. And these two duplicates go to different museums or different herbaria. And the original data had a location written as text. But one of those two herbaria is quite interested in mapping those data and so they put in the effort to georeference the specimen. Now if I had these unique identifiers on the organism, the individual, then as soon as the one herbarium does the georeferencing, the other one can get the georeference for free. Similarly, if the other herbarium is more interested in the taxonomic revision of that species, and they do a taxonomic revision, now the other collection can get the revision. They can get the, re the new determination for the same organism for free. It's like broadening the impact uh, and the, the expertise whenever part of that individual is seen. So clearly a benefit there. And then something that's more looking into the brave new world of, is the semantic web. And here I would describe briefly what kinds of capabilities are available there. The semantic web is built from having pieces of data that are identified. They have to, it's required that they have these. So if we put our specimen into the semantic web domain, it has an identifier and it has 
metadata associated with it. So it will have a scientific name, it will have a country, it will have all these other kinds of pieces of information attached to it. Now, also out there in the semantic web is information about the country, about its gross domestic product, about the protected areas in that country, about all kinds of things. Information that's just out there on the web. And we don't track it in our specimen databases. It's not really what we do. But because it's out there in the semantic web and identified, we have ways of combining information across all kinds of data sources. My specimen, along with information for the country and its protected areas, along with lists of information within the protected area. So we're basically creating this huge network of information that we can connect across and ask questions about things that we don't know ourselves and we don't actually have the information ourselves. So basically then what we're doing by putting identifiers onto our specimens and putting them onto the web persistently and resolvably is putting them into the huge soup of linked open data in which all kinds of interesting questions can be asked across disciplines. So another huge benefit. This is only beginning to see its potential. So it's the brave new world. Now I'm going to switch gears to talk about one example of the use of the identifiers and that is basically applying them to put them on in the process of digitization or, or capturing the data. So to introduce the idea, here we have a QR, a quick response code. You may have seen these on advertisements in magazines or on billboards or who knows where. These are, you, these are resolvable identifiers. They're resolvable with the right apparatus or software. With your cell phone, if it's a smartphone, with a QR code reader, you can take a picture of that and open the web page and know what it is. If I had a cell phone that was a smartphone, I would do that right here and find out what that is. That's what they're for. To get more information about something, to basically say, here's Wikipedia on the thing I'm trying to show you in my limited space. It's connecting me to the web. So this is a bunch of information about QRC codes that is not terribly relevant to the, the broader picture. This is the more interesting part, and that is the application of it. The idea here is if you have a way to print a QR code, it's like a barcode, but in two dimensions. If you have a way to print a QR code, you can put it on a specimen and now you've achieved the same capability that you've done for posters or magazine advertisements and so on for your collections. So you can go into somebody's collection who has QR codes with your smartphone, take that picture, and find out everything about what's in that jar if it has been databased. And I can send that QR code to somebody, a colleague across the world, and they can open it up, and they can look at it, and they can see the same information. So I've connected through from the physical object through a portal to the broader world of digital information by adding this to the, to the management scheme. So those are inexpensive to make. Um, one could argue that if you wanted to put those codes on all of the insects in your collection of 15 million insects, that there's some cost to that. That's true. But if you do that on the, the insects that are most important to you and that benefit most from doing so, then you've still increased your capabilities because you can put those things on pins, for example. So here's an example where they want to use this technology in herbarium situation. I think this is a um, project at the University of Oslo in Norway where they're digitizing their lichen collections 
and in so doing they're capturing with a QR code on their images. So that's their setup. Here's an example showing that when they do the, the image capture they've already attached a QR code to the envelope in which this specimen exists and they're digitizing that with the label that's inside and with the contents that's inside. So now this whole digital image is on the web with a QR code and anybody can click on that to find the page where this whole thing has been published. And here's just another picture of the same thing. We'll have several <coughs> different images. Here was the label with the, the code on it. And that, that code is then associated with all the specimen images that they have taken. So they're building up an infrastructure at low cost where they can apply this little label as a 2D barcode and have access to the information through a nice piece of technology. So I'll leave you with a thought of, okay, maybe it's not a bad thing to start putting labels on things. That there is some use to it. We'll find value in it and that it's worth the effort. 